Good evening, everyone. My name is Takiwa Smith, founder and executive director of Science Engineering Mathematics Link, also known as SCM Link. And I want to welcome you to our Teen Science Cafe. Our Teen Science Cafe is a program of our Math and Science Career Academy. And the goal of it is to expose teens to STEM and STEM, career, STEM careers by providing opportunities for them to meet STEM professionals, learn about their career journey in a more informal setting um, at a time that's critical for them making their post-secondary um, decisions about what they want to be when they grow up, what they're going to major in college, and for the middle schoolers, what they may classes they may take in high school. And so we are so excited that we're still able to host this virtually for you. We have some really cool scientists thus far, and I'm really, really excited about tonight's topic So, and tonight's speaker. So with further ado, I'm going to allow our program coordinator, Ms. Carlin Pounders, to introduce tonight's speakers. Hi, guys. Um, Carl Guy II is currently a master's candidate at Howard University in the biology department, studying in Dr. George Mendendorf's lab. His research interests include herpetology, ecology, evolutionary biology, behavior, conservation biology, natural natural history, and human-wildlife conflict. His thesis research is on the behavior of the Chinese water dragon. He is also a research intern at the Smithsonian National Zoological Park, where he studies the behavior of Cuban, Cuban crocodiles. Through the zoo, he's also involved in Cuban crocodile conservation work in Cuba. He has, some, he has some cool photos to share with us from that. Additionally, he is a fellow with the Cooperative Ecosystem Studies Unit through the National Office in partnership with the National Park Service. Through his fellowship, he is helping to develop a national database for the CESU. That sounds really, that sounds really amazing, you guys. Definitely wanna hear more about that. Outside of school and work, he has a lot of interests including outdoor activities like hiking and kayaking, but also playing video games, drawing, and learning to play guitar. He also harps fun. So clearly Carl um, is very well-rounded and has a lot of interest and he's going to share with us more. So I'll go, go, go ahead and hand it over to him. Good evening, everyone. Welcome, my name is Carl Guyton II. Thank you, Takiwa and Carolyn for that nice introduction. So my talk tonight is going to be on reconnecting with nature and we're gonna do that through a virtual guide into the field of herpetology. So this first picture here is of a Cuban crocodile that I took while I was in Cuba. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. So a little bit about me, um, much of this was just stated. So I'm a third year master's student at Howard University. I'm also an intern at the Smithsonian National Zoo. For my research, I study the behavior of the Chinese water dragon, which is that little green lizard on the left there. And as part of my internship, I study the behavior of our Cuban crocodiles, specifically looking at how our adults respond to hatchling calls. And on top of that, I'm part of a research team assessing the health of captive Cuban crocodiles in a breeding facility in Zapata, Cuba. So here are some pictures of me doing some of the work that I do in herpetology. On the left, I'm um, labeling blood slides from Cuba. And that bottom left picture, I'm holding two of the baby Cuban crocodiles. And the two pictures on the right are from us collecting eggs at the National Zoo. And I was very sweaty after doing that because the nests of the crocodiles are very hot. <laughs> So growing up as a kid, um, I used to watch a lot of nature documentaries and things like that. And that's a lot of what got me inspired about herpetology. Um, 
probably my biggest influence on TV was Steve Irwin, who is probably a lot of people's influences. But um, watching Steve um, perform on The Crocodile Hunter was a big influence for me. And ever since seeing him, like I, I really loved crocodiles, but I've always loved all kinds of animals. And so growing up as a kid, me and my siblings, we'd go outside and we'd collect frogs and stuff whenever it'd be raining or go out into the woods and just sit out there for hours. One of the really cool things about growing up in the Southeast in Georgia was that we had a lot of to go out and find. And so on this screen right here, we've got six different species of salamanders that you can find in Georgia. So going from top left to bottom right, we've got the marbled salamander, tiger salamander, a black-bellied salamander, a spotted dusky salamander, a three-lined salamander, and a pigeon mountain salamander. So one of the really cool things about the pigeon mountain salamander is that it's found on one mountain in Georgia. So that's the only place in the world that you will find this particular species of salamander. And then we've also got a lot of other um, cool critters to find. So common snapping turtle, barber's map turtle, a gray tree frog, gopher tortoise, and even cottonmouths are things that I have found just while out exploring in Georgia. As you can see, that cottonmouth is on the road, so I had to help him off the road so that he didn't get hurt or hurt somebody else. One of the cool things about herpetology is that you can do a lot of different things. So one of the things that I've really enjoyed doing both as a student and professionally was doing outreaches. So that top middle picture there, um, I did an outreach for the Flint River Aquarium, which is my former employer. And we did basically what was um, a story presentation where I dressed up as an alligator. We read a book, I think the book was called There's an Alligator Under My Bed. And so I basically played out the part of the alligator while my coworker read the story. And these are really good opportunities to both engage with the community, but also explain how reptiles and amphibians are um, helpful for the environment and also beneficial to people and how we can learn to coexist with these animals that are in a lot of cases very frightening to people. And similar situations with the bottom two right pictures, we were doing an outreach program with snakes. So I've got an Eastern king snake around my neck in the middle picture and I'm working with a red tail boa constrictor and a constrictor in that bottom right picture. As you can see, the little kids are very interested and intrigued with the snake. And on the left hand side of that picture, um, me and my professor, Dr. Tom Lorenz, when I was an undergrad, we were out surveying in the Flint River in Georgia, not to be confused with the Flint River in Michigan. And uh, we were doing some map turtle surveys. So we found a couple map turtles and we were just checking to see how they were doing in their environment. So at the National Zoo in DC, I get to work with and see a lot of really cool animals, animals that a lot of people probably wouldn't get to see otherwise if it weren't for zoos. And so there's kind of this debate that a lot of people have as to whether or not um, zoos are good or bad entities. And my thought process on it is that while it would be great if we didn't need zoos, the fact of the matter remains that we do need zoos because a lot of these species wouldn't be able to survive if there weren't captive breeding programs for them. For instance, the frog that you see in the middle of that picture there is the Panamanian golden frog. It is currently extinct in the wild. The only place you'll ever be able to see this frog right now is in a zoo. Currently, a lot of zoos that have them are working on breeding them 
so that eventually they can release them back into the wild. But one of the main threat that's facing them is called chytrid fungus. And it's a fungal disease that covers their skin and basically prevents them from being able to breathe and get um, gases exchanged because they primarily breathe through their skin. And so it hardens their skin to the point where they can't breathe and so they'll die. So without zoos, we would not be able to save the, the species and several others like them. And a lot of the animals, especially in the reptile collection, they're facing threats of extinction. Um, the crocodilian in that top left picture is a temestima. It's listed as vulnerable. The bottom left is a Chinese alligator. It's critically endangered. The lizard in the top is a grand blue caiman iguana, critically endangered. The yellow spotted Amazon river turtle is vulnerable. And the Homer's hingeback turtle tortoises are also under threat of extinction. So without zoos, a lot of these animals would not have a chance of surviving in the wild on their own. And then here are some other animals that we have at the zoo. So at the left, we have the Philippine crocodile, the Japanese giant salamander, which is really cool. It's the second largest species of salamander in the world. They can get up to about four feet long, which is humongous. None of the salamanders that we have in the United States even come close to that size. Then we have a Central American Bushmaster, which is, I believe, the lar longest venomous snake in North America. And then the Gaboon Viper, which has the longest fangs of any, any venomous snake in the world. And then these are my favorites at the zoo. These are some of the crocodiles that I get to work with. We have on the left are Gariel. And then the two pictures on the right are my four Cuban crocodiles that I primarily do my research with. So we've got Miguel, Rose, Blanche, and Hefe. And if the girl names sound familiar, that is because they are named after the Golden Girls. And we do have a female Cuban crocodile named Dorothy as well, but she's not pictured in these pictures. And if you're wondering to yourself, well, how do you tell the difference between an alligator and a crocodile? I am here to explain that to you. <laughs> so here in this picture, we have a crocodile on top, a caiman in the middle, and an alligator at the bottom. So the best way to tell them apart is by looking at their jaw structure. Crocodiles generally have a long, narrow V-shaped snout, and alligators generally have a broad U-shaped snout. And caimans, their jaws a little bit in the middle. So it's not quite as narrow as crocodiles, but it's not quite as broad. Or it's not quite as narrow as crocodiles, but not quite as broad as alligators. And then crocodiles, you can see both top rows and bottom rows of teeth whenever the mouth is closed, which you can clearly see in this juvenile's picture. But with alligators, the top jaw is wider than the bottom jaw is. And so the bottom sets of teeth fit in sockets inside the top jaw. So you can generally only see the top rows of teeth whenever the mouth is closed. So that's kind of like a quick rundown of some of the things that I've done in my career so far. Um, one of the cool things that I've gotten to do as part of my internship at the National Zoo is actually work on conservation work in Cuba. And a lot of what we're doing is assessing the health of the crocodile individuals at the breeding facility there to make sure that they're getting proper nutrients, they're maintaining proper weights, not getting um, harmed by other crocodiles in their pens and things like that to make sure they can survive to produce healthy offspring with the eventual hope that we can release their offspring back into the wild. Cuban crocodiles, unfortunately, they're listed as critically endangered. 
And the main threats that are facing them are habitat loss and hybridization with the American crocodile, which is also native to Cuba. Now, the reason why hybridization is such a negative thing for them is that the Cuban crocodile population is already very small. And so if you have Cuban crocodiles interbreeding with American crocodiles, you're basically losing that genetic identity for the Cuban crocodiles. And eventually, if this keeps happening, we'll no longer have any pure Cuban crocodiles. And so that species would essentially go extinct. So that's what we're working to do in Cuba is to prevent the Cuban crocodiles from going extinct. I have a quick video that I want to show you guys of some of my adventures out herping. So I took my brother out on a kayaking trip with me and we were just exploring, not, not really purposefully herping, but just seeing if we could find anything. It was a really lovely day out. I think this was actually on a Memorial Day one year, not this year, <laughs> but um, it was just a really nice day and I wanted to to get out and this was his first time ever kayaking. So it was a really good time for us to just to just kind of bond together as well. So this is in a cypress swamp in southwest Georgia. I love being out in the swamp. It's um one of the most peaceful places for me. Seeing cypress trees and seeing the water is just really calming for me. And I love just being in the atmosphere of the swamp. And I'll just kind of narrate um, key pieces as we go along, but I won't talk through the whole thing.
Um, so, Carl, I have a quick question. This is Tequila. Um, mm-hmm. How are you recording when you're ca- kayaking? Do you have like a go can? Do you have a helmet? Because I'm like, what? He's like, I'm kayaking. I'm like, where is he recording all this with? <laughs> yeah, so I, I had a GoPro mounted on my on a head mount. Okay. Yeah, before I got my GoPro, I would try and record on my phone, and <laughs> that was very, very difficult. <laughs> I almost dropped in, in the swamp a couple of times. Can you guys hear the audio? No. Okay. We're just seeing you move through the swamp. Okay. For most of it, that's not too important because it's not a whole lot of audio, but I did want to, I want you guys to hear the frog calls at the end. But. I have another question. I'm sorry, I'm too lazy to type. <laughs> oh, you're fine. Is kayaking, why is kayaking a good thing to go herping? Is that what you call it? Herping? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Why is kayaking good to her, go herping or way people go herping? So, especially for me, since I primarily work with crocodilians and they're semi aquatic, it's a very good way to get to to get to them um a lot of the times they're not going to be on the land they're going to be actually in the water and so the best way to do that is either kayak canoe or you know take a motor powered boat i generally prefer to not be on motor powered boats because they can they can hear you coming and then you're not as likely to find them whereas on a kayak or a canoe you can be much more quieter and not disturb them as well as any of the other wildlife around. But also a lot of other herps are, um, if they're not semi-aquatic, they're generally found near water. So anything from like your alligators, snakes, turtles, not so much lizards, but salamanders and frogs, you're gonna find those in or around water. And so kayaking is a good way to get across the water. So right here, a baby gator has emerged in the swamp and is pretty much swimming right up to my kayak. So me and my brother are gonna stop and sit here and take pictures of it for a couple minutes. So the interesting thing about alligators and other crocodilians is that they exhibit parental care, which is incredibly rare among reptiles. Uh, There's only a couple species of snakes that have a small portion of parental care, but nothing on the level that you find with alligators and crocodiles. And so with this juvenile alligator, it was very likely that its mother was somewhere in the very close vicinity. We didn't actually see her, but she was very close by. Um, This individual was probably born either that year or the year before.
But as you'll notice, this baby alligator is really not phased by our presence here. We were in um, a state park, so there's generally a, a lot of traffic going through. As you can see, there was cars going by and other people kayak and canoe through here. So they're somewhat used to the presence of humans, which can be both a good and a bad thing. It was obviously good for me at this point in time because I got to see it. But that's where the issue of human wildlife conflict comes into play. Um, a lot of situations where people or pets end up getting attacked or eaten by alligators is generally because people have fed them. So naturally, they're going to be wary and have um, a flight response and whenever they see humans. But if you feed them, then they start to associate humans with food and they lose that fear of people. That's generally when people get hurt. So now we're transitioning to some underwater surveying. So now I'm snorkeling. <laughs> and I've just found an Eastern River cooter. If you look at the turtle's face, you can see that he saw that I pointed at him. He was like, oh, no, I got to go. <laughs> So this is a really large male river cooter. And the way that we can tell that is we're looking at its fingernails right here. So the males have these really long fingernails to basically tantalize the face of the females during courting. So this is again me with my undergraduate professor, Dr. Tom Lorenz. Oh, that's your professor right there? Yes. As you can see, these are really pretty turtles. They've got, um, very cool patterns on the tops of their shells. So why is it that um, there's only one that we're seeing? Like, you know how some, um, I guess, um, you know, wh why aren't we seeing like groups of the animals? Yeah, so um, generally whenever you see turtles basking, you'll see them in large groups. But since we found this one in the water, um, he was probably hunting or just taking a break. So there were probably others nearby that we just didn't see. But generally, they're a lot more conspicuous if you see them out basking. You could, just, you could definitely see his um, little fingernails just then very clearly. Yes. So how so often, that, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. 
Oh, I was just going to ask how often, again, are you um, in the field like this? Um, um, it, it really depends. Um, when I was an undergrad, me and my professor were out at least three or four times a week. <laughs> Um, since that I've been in like grad school, I, yes, um, since I've been in grad school, I haven't had quite the same amount of time to go out. So it's been a lot less. And is frequent. that, is it more so, um, more research and, um, you know, that type of like actual, like, uh, reading, you know, other people's journals and things of that nature? Yeah, it's um, it's that, and then I've also got you know the the internship and the fellowship, so all of those things you know kind of take time out of my day. And then also it's where I'm at. So in D.C., there's not a lot of good habitat right there in D.C., so a lot of it's um, kind of driving distance out of the city, and so that's you know additional time that you have to factor in. Whereas in undergrad, um, a lot of the stuff I could do either right there on campus or in places not too far from campus. So right here, we stumbled upon a Florida cotton mouth. This was actually taken um, a couple of days ago when I went out herping. So one of the best times to actually go herping is at night when it's raining. <laughs> um, you'll get a lot of amphibian movement, especially frogs and salamanders. And because of that movement, you'll also have a lot of snakes moving to try and hunt, hunt those frogs and salamanders which is what we suspected that this cottonmouth was doing. We were hearing a lot of frogs calling in this area. So here you can see you're poking out. So unfortunately, cottonmouths get a very bad rap here in the United States. And while they are venomous snakes, they certainly aren't the menacing, terrorizing snakes that many people close them as. Um, you'll hear a lot of stories about people being chased by cotton mouths and cotton mouths being very aggressive. They are very misunderstood snakes. Um, cotton mouths are not aggressive. They do tend to be defensive though. And the difference is that an aggressive animal is going to basically attack you unprovoked. Whereas a defensive animal will you generally stand its ground and not back away from a challenge unless you know there's a clear line of escape. And that's also generally where the thinking that a snake is chasing people comes from is that the only way of escape for the snake is in the direction that you happen to be standing in. So the snake isn't actually chasing you, it's trying to get away from you. You're just in the way of the snake getting away from you. But here we were, we were contemplating um, using a snake hook to get the, the cotton mouth a little bit out of the brush so that we could get a better view of it. But because it was coming up to us, we were basically waiting to see if it would just come out on its own. So you can see the snake's got its head up and its tongue flicking. So it can clearly see us and it's you know kind of surveying the situation what's going on are we predators are we just really weird animals that are just looking at it like what's going on so that's kind of what's going through the snake's head at this point
So if I may, um, we already have uh, someone watching who expressed interest in learning about um, how to find um, colleges that offer quality programs for this. Uh, mm -hmm. Hopefully, uh, Scott doesn't mind if I share his first name, but he says that um, he is a fellow herpetologist. Um, he works with the Georgia Reptile Society, and um, he's in the junior program for the International Herpetological Symposium. So uh, Scott said he would love to hear about how to go about finding colleges that offer quality programs because he is a senior this year and he's planning to go into veterinary herpetology. If you are in Georgia, I would highly, highly, highly recommend going to Georgia Southwestern, which is where I went to school at. So that was my professor from Georgia Southwestern, Dr. Tom Lorenz. Um, I would highly recommend you going to George Southwestern. He's a great herpetologist, a great teacher, and a great mentor. Um, I'm sorry, uh, correction, uh, Scout is a she. I'm sorry for uh, using the wrong pronouns. Um, but Scout would also be curious to know if there's a program offered in college um, for, um, if there's a program, I'm sorry. Oh, um, so Scout has their venomous training certificate and they're curious okay. if there's a program in college related to that. Not as far as I'm aware, however, um, Let's see, you can pr probably, let's see. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Depending on the school that you go to, you might be able to get um, like an internship class that counts as credit where you can do an internship at a zoo or an aquarium or something like that where they have venomous snakes where you could get hands-on training. And so like um, nearby Georgia Southwestern, there's um, Chihaw Park in Albany, Georgia, so that they have, um, they have venomous snakes. And there's, when I was in undergrad there, there was a internship class where we partnered with Chihaw. And so students would go there and basically, um, an internship role where you kind of learned how to be a zookeeper and take care of the animals and trainings and things like that. So that might be um, kind of parallel to what what Scout is looking for. So I know you mentioned um, that when you were younger is where your you know initial um, STEM journey began. Um, what was it like? deciding uh, which college to go to for this and, um, you know, that process of then applying for your, um, then applying to um, get your master's and then securing these internships. Yeah, so my process for undergrad was actually, it's actually kind of hard because I knew that I loved animals and I knew that I wanted to major in biology, but since I had never seen anyone that looked like me being a herpetologist, I didn't know if that was a valid career option. And so when I first went into undergrad, I went in as um, basically a pre-med major. And so I was on the pre-med track for my first two years and once I started getting into the upper level um, biology pre-med labs, I realized that like, I didn't like it. And unfortunately what happened to me in undergrad was I didn't have a great, my first institution, I started off at Valdosta State, then I transferred to George Southwestern, which is where I graduated from. At Valdosta State, I didn't have a great advisor. 
And so because I wasn't really sure on whether or not I wanted to do pre-med or just regular biology track, my advisor switched me every other semester. And eventually what happened was my curriculum was messed up to the point where I couldn't register for a full course load of classes. So that's primarily why I had to transfer. But when I got to GSW, we started taking field biology classes, one of which was natural history and herpetology, which where we were out catching reptiles and amphibians. And that's when I knew like this was the area that I wanted to be in. <laughs> and so once I did that and I found out, you know, this is where I want to be, I kept taking um, those upper level biology classes, got my bachelor's degree, and then my professor, Dr. Lorenz, who the one that I was out herping with, he was instrumental in helping me find um, a graduate program. Finding a grad school was a different challenge. Um, one of the things that most grad schools want you to do is find and talk to an advisor before you apply. And so that requires, you know, doing a lot of research on what advisors are out there, what their research interests are, what they're currently doing research on, finding out if they have funding and all of those kinds of things. And so for the longest time, I was striking out on finding a potential advisor that was a good fit for me, but also had funding. Um, several of the professors that I talked to either weren't tenure track professors, their contracts were expiring, or they just didn't have funding to take on a student. The other thing that you that I had to keep in mind was I knew that while I wanted to eventually go on to get my PhD, I wasn't ready to go straight from undergrad to a PhD. So I knew that I wanted to do a master's in between. Some students go straight from their undergrad to a PhD, which is completely fine. You know, if you feel like you can do that, go ahead and do that. I knew that I wasn't ready to do that. And so um, a lot of programs are beginning to not fund or not fund as much master students as they are PhD students. Actually, when I got accepted to Howard, they had just voted that they were no longer going to be funding master's students, that they were only going to be funding PhD students. But because I found an advisor who was willing to, you know, work on the research that I wanted to work on, I went ahead and took that jump, which for me has mostly worked out for the best. Does that answer your question? Yes, so Carl, I do have um, a question I think that you, you made. Definitely... Go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, okay, so I just want to reiterate something because, you know, they always tell you in science, go straight to the PhD program. What are the things that you are getting um, you feel like you were getting by doing the master's program? that will make you more successful once you do the PhD that you don't think you would have got if you went straight to a PhD program? So if, if you don't have a lot of research experience or a lot of experience doing the type of technical writing that you're going to do for publishing a paper, I think it's advantageous to do a master's before doing the PhD. Um, for me, that was that was the biggest reason. Um, while I would say that GSW's biology program was great in you know preparing me for the type of research that I wanted to do and exposing me to field biology in a bunch of different areas, I didn't feel like my personal um, experience with the technical writing for publishing a paper was 
adequate to go straight into a PhD. I thought that the additional time of getting a master's, that being a shorter program, and you know, basically learning how to write a paper through the master's and then having that knowledge to go into a PhD would be better than trying to figure out how to do it just going straight into the PhD. And so that was my thought process. So who was your mentor? In undergrad or graduate school? Uh, can you share both? Um, in undergrad, my so I had I had an advisor, but I also had um, separate mentors. So in undergrad, my advisor was Dr. Ian Brown, but my two mentors were Dr. Tom Lawrence, who was the one that you saw that I was herping with, and my other uh, mentor was Dr. Bob Harrington. So both of them were herpetologists. Um, my mentor, sorry, Dr. Can you repeat again um, what institutions they're with again? Georgia Southwestern State University. Thank you. You're welcome. And so my mentor, um, Dr. Bob Harrison, unfortunately, he passed away shortly after I graduated. But um, they were instrumental in basically helping me forge the path that I'm on right now. And then in grad Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and then in grad Scout school, um, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and in grad school, my, my advisor and mentor is Dr. George Mendorf. Did Scott have another question? I was just, um, I just wanted to share uh, that Scout uh, got really excited and said that um, Dr. Harrington was their mentor when they were young as well. And um, yeah, they said he was an incredible man. He was. So I have a question. Um, how do you, you like herpetology, right? How yes. do you pick what reptile you're going to study um, or focus on? Or do you just have to like know them all? Because it seems like based on, you know, the kayaking that you showed us, like you see one reptile, you end up seeing various species of reptiles while you're out. So they're like all in the same ecosystem pretty much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, as far as research, research goes, you can certainly pick as few or as many as you want to. Um, crocodiles are my favorite, so that's why I focus on those. But um, you should definitely be aware of as many as you can because as you saw in you know the videos, you're likely going to encounter several different species of a variety of different taxa. Um, you could be out just you know looking for just turtles, but you might come across a cottonmouth, or you might come across an alligator, or another different species of snake, or whatever. So you should definitely be aware and knowledgeable about you know the majority of the reptiles and amphibians that could possibly be in your area, but you might be focused on just one or a few of those species. Yeah, I can't imagine how many different, you know, types of species there is, uh, especially between, um, you know, as a herpetologist studying reptiles and amphibians, like that just sounds like, you know, a, a large amount of, um, you know, animals that you're, that you can choose yeah. to study. 
Yeah. And actually, you know, that's a great question. So one of the things that I usually take out into the field with me is a field guide. So in the southeast United States, we have the Peterson Field Guide for Reptiles and Amphibians of the Southeast United States. And so this is a great, great tool to know all of the reptiles and amphibians that could possibly be in your area, your state, um, your section of the country or whatever. And it's a great little tool to help you to, and you don't have to memorize what everything is. You know, you just have to be like, okay, that's a frog. Let me look in here, see, okay, I'm in Southwest Georgia. These are the frogs in Southwest Georgia. And you can, for the most part, pretty easily narrow down what and what the reptile amphibian is. That's a really helpful tool that I carry with me almost everywhere. I wish they would make um, a virtual one of these so I can have it like on the app on my phone. Because unfortunately, like I said, the best time to go herping is at night when it's raining. <laughs> and so books in the rain don't usually get along too well. <laughs> So I just asked um, for those watching to put any last questions in the um, comments or chat um, from whatever platform they're watching. Um, while we wait to see if we get any more questions, um, uh, and as we wrap up, um, I guess, is there anything else that you would like to share as far as um, you know, the, the, the benefits of going into this field. I mean, obviously, you know, we saw through the video with, you know, being in, immersed in nature, um, you know, heard about, um, did you share a little bit about, um, like the database that you're, that you're creating and the type of impactful things that you're doing? Yeah. So, I mean, talking about, um, the benefits of going into this field, They're, they are immense. Um, you know, from just from my perspective, I love being out in nature and being in the field. So if you're a very outdoorsy person, you know, herpetology and, you know, you like critters that a lot of people tend to not like, herpetology is probably a really good fit for you. But herpetologists aren't always out in the field. There are definitely, um, laboratory and medical applications for herpetology as well. Um, one of the biggest examples is that um, the copperhead, which is a venomous snake that we have in the Eastern United States, its venom is actually being used for breast cancer treatments. Um, a lot of frog poisons are medically significant for upcoming um, and future medicines. Um, I think it was last year or the year before that there was um, some research done on crocodile blood and its ability, ability to fight off HIV. So there's a lot of different applications that you can use for, for herpetology. So one of the coolest things, in my opinion, about reptiles and amphibians is kind of where they fit and in the food web. So a lot of reptiles and amphibians serve as both predators and prey. And so they're critical parts of ecosystems being able to function properly. So there's a lot of really cool research to be done in herpetology, and that's part of the reason why I find the field so fascinating. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Carl. Um, if you, uh, before before we conclude uh, this part, if you can um, share your contact info, um, you know, how people can keep up with your work and get in um, contact with you. Sure. So, um, you can follow me on social media at Afrosuchia. So that's A-F-R-O-S-U-C-H-I-A. I'm on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. 
And my email is also afrosukia at gmail.com. And yeah, um, if you have any further questions, just shoot me an email or DM on any of those social media platforms and I'll be happy to talk with anyone about any of these topics or anything not related to this as well. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Hope everyone enjoyed the presentation. Well, you did a really great job, Car. Thank you so much. I learned so much and I don't even like reptiles. Um, <laughs> I didn't know that snakes are actually trying to run away from you. So <laughs> that is new. Um, but I really try not to spend it too much time. But um, I do have one question. Like, what are your last like words? If you know, advice for people who, um, you know, kind of like you, like got outside. So people who kids like to get outside, but their parents don't, or like, mm -hmm. like getting too dirty like how do you balance that encouraging kids or doing that curiosity um for your children if you don't want to be outside but you have a kid that likes to go outside and look for critters or bring them back uh that's that's a great question um you know i think my mom kind of grappled with that a little bit because on the one hand, she was always very encouraging of us, um, you know, exploring the things that we'd like to explore. So she would buy us tons of books and things like that to, you know, stir up our curiosity. But at the same time, you know, she didn't want us playing in the mud at, you know, 10 o'clock at night in the rain and then, you know, bringing snakes in the house and stuff like that. So it, it's definitely, it's definitely a balance. Um, I would say, you know, try your best not to damper your child's imagination while, you know, also making sure that they're being safe. Um, you know, one of the things that I get, I get questions about all the time is, um, you know, people being worried about snakes in their yard especially venomous snakes and you know it's it's a difficult it's a difficult topic because you know on the one hand as you saw in the video we were mere feet away from that cotton mouth and we left it alone and it left us alone but if you're talking to like a three or four year old child you know they might not understand don't bother the snake they're going to want to go pick it up and so, you know, even as an adult, as a herpetologist, like I get excited. I'm just like, I want to pick up the snake, even though I know it's poisonous or venomous. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, there it's it's a fine balance there that you that you have to walk. But um I would say be encouraging of of your child and you know, kind of foster their imagination and their creativity, but also make sure that you're educating them on, you know, safe ways to be imaginative. I guess is the best, best way to put that. Okay. Um, one last question before you write, wrap up. So are there any um, like YouTube channels or social media? Because you say, you know, 10 o'clock at night, you probably pretty much have to be a teenager, right? To be out at dark looking for reptiles. So what can people do when they're younger to explore that? Are there shows that they can watch or, you know, to? Yeah, there's definitely a, a lot of shows. So like, like I said, when I was growing up, um, I would watch um, 
Steve Irwin on the Crocodile Hunter, um, the Nate Nature broadcast on PBS, which I think still air now. Um, a lot of National Geographic documentaries, which um, I think they're all on Disney Plus now. So okay. go watch any of the National Geographic documentaries, the shows like um, Planet Earth, um, any of the David Attenborough documentaries are really good. And then um, there's really been, I don't know if it's kind of a boom or if it's just my generation, but a lot of us are getting really excited and really motivated to, you know, do a lot of field work and stuff. So there's a lot of up and coming scientists that are doing really cool stuff on social media. Um, a lot of a lot of my friends are doing things like this. Um, my friend Courtney at Black Girl Birding, um, Aaron McGee, Afro Herper. The Find the Lizard. Uh, find the Lizard, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've never wanted to find the lizard, but I'm like, oh, maybe I should think about it, right? Like, I know she looks find the lizard, right? Yeah. So social Chelsea. media documentaries, Chelsea. huh? Yeah, Chelsea Connor does uh, Did You a Know? You know, there's lots of different ways that you can you can interact with these things without, you know, actually going out at 10 o'clock at night in the rain. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Carl. I think everyone learned so much from you um, and especially like seeing the kayak and all that and what you do in the field. So thank you so much. Or even how to explore um, herpetology and get the education. So any final words before we go? Words of advice for future herpetologists? Words of advice. Um, stay rooted in nature, you know reconnect with nature um you're gonna find your way once once you find that connection to nature well thank you so much carl we appreciate you giving us your time and thank you everyone for tuning in um, our next science cafe is october 7th and we'll have an engineer and we just appreciate you tuning in. And if anyone you know that may have been interested and missed it, they can check us out on our YouTube channel and learn all about herpetology from Carl Guyton II. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a good evening. Thank you, guys. <laughs>